back. We're live. We're live? Yep. All right. Welcome to the internet. My name is Nathan Chan, and thanks for joining us for today's Cello Chat, hosted by Cello Bello. A round of applause. A round of applause. Excellent. Well, my name is Nathan Chan, and I'm the assistant principal cellist of the Seattle Symphony, and today we're talking about innovation in classical music and what the future of classical music might mean, maybe even the future of music in general. So I thought we could start out with a little bit of music while we're waiting for everybody to get in, and uh, let's just begin with some beautiful music. <laughs> and start any sort of discussion and thing. I learned this from Mike Block. He, whenever uh, Mike Block would give a, a talk or a, 
or any sort of a chat, he always began with music. And I always thought that was a wonderful idea because uh, who likes to hear, when we're talking about music, who likes to hear chatter first? Well, of course, we begin with music. So welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. Once again, my name is Nathan Chan, and I'm the assistant principal cellist of the Seattle Symphony. So I'm coming to you live from Seattle, Washington, and I'm answering your questions. And it looks like we have a question already. The first question is, can you discuss the process of developing your personal sound and sound care? Every great musician has a sound that is identifiable. You know exactly who is playing without seeing them. Whether it be Daniel Shafran or Elisa Weilerstein, how do we work on this and not become poor versions of our teachers or idols? And a comment from Frank Straza. Welcome, Frank, to the stream. I've really enjoyed following your journey on Instagram when you were auditioning for the symphony and now you are assistant principal. So cool and congrats. Well deserved. Well, thank you so much for those kind comments. And to answer your question, you know, I'm uh, still developing my own type of personal sound and sound character. But what's really been important for me is developing confidence in what I want to express in the right hand. You know, I think we go through so many iterations of technique, fixing what's going on in the right hand, that in the end, the most important part is that we forget all the technique and let our inner voice express ourselves. So, uh... <laughs> There is so much character to be expressed in the right hand, and I think what one needs is the freedom to explore. And I, you know, to be honest, what's been kind of strange and interesting for me is I've been thinking a lot about the vocalization of the cello and the vocal quality. You know, us cellists, we always say that the cello is most like the human voice because of the range and whatnot, and yada, yada. You've heard, the, you've heard that story before. But when we really talk about how one develops sound, I often try and kind of emulate and mimic what would it be like if I were speaking and I was playing the cello. So if I were saying, welcome to cello chat here on cello bello on the cello, and I was just playing open strings, I go, <laughs> There's so much character that can be had with the right hand. It's somehow, you know, if we're thinking from a very neurological perspective, the neurons that we send to our mouth and, and vocal cords to speak, well, you can send similar kinds of neurons to your hand in the types of... You know, there's so many... It's, it's part of the fun of playing the cello is is allowing that feeling to come across. So actually, I would encourage you, um, just for fun, can you, can you express different emotions with just your right hand without any type of music or anything involved? So let's say I wanted to, uh, you know, we kind of did like a excited announcer voice for uh, the right hand. If we were to do a, a very melancholy type of sound with the right hand, what would it feel like, you know? There's so much beauty in the right hand. Um, and of course, I'm internalizing a lot of cello technique that has been taught by my wonderful teachers before Richard Aaron, Xin Lin, and Irene Sharp over the many years, and of uh, Gautier Capuçon, wonderful things about, you know, bow speed, bow pressure. It's, the secret is turning those types of things into a humanistic type of ex form of expression. Because no one wants to think, you know, oh, I want to play closer to the bridge, when it's louder and I want to be more excited and it has to be absorbed and internalized and really become yourself. Anyways, 
as you can see, I'm kind of crazy. Okay, anyways, now let's uh, on to the next question. And this comes from our YouTube live stream. Welcome, YouTube. I hope you're not going down any strange rabbit holes just yet. Um, hey, Nathan, big fan. Recently saw you on Coffee Chats with Nikki and Joe Chui. Yay, Buffalo. I was wondering how you started your YouTube channel and got so popular. Oh, I don't know if it's, you know. Uh, I was also wondering how an intermediate cellist like myself could start one. Thank you for your time. Well, my journey on YouTube, and this is a great segue into today's topic about how to find ways to innovate on the cello. You know, my whole spiel uh, is I think there's a, and you guys clearly understand that because you're kind of partaking in it, is there is an immense power to be had between the intersection of the arts and technology like we are uh, experiencing right now. We are hanging out on a chat, on a stream, on the interwebs via zeros and ones. And what's amazing about this whole notion, you know, I, I, I guess part of it is coincidence. I grew up in a generation where technology had an explosive growth is that I think what used to be confined to a, a hall or a room can now live on on the internet and be shared with many more people uh, than before at thus widening the ability for us to reach a larger and more broad audience in this sector so to uh, go back to your question about YouTube I actually just started YouTube because I was uploading old concert footage you know when you're a little kid and your mom takes a little video of you on your on your on their video camera what do you do with all that footage well why not upload it to a place where I don't have to save the tapes anymore and uh, that's a very crude way of saying how a, my YouTube channel got started but the real change happened when I realized you know yes uh, you know you can kind of re-upload performances for posterity on YouTube but what happens if you actually produce and cultivate your own content specifically for the medium and that kind of changes um, makes a big change for the way you think because then all of a sudden you realize oh well I don't know if people want to just stare at a um, a steady shot the in entire time while they're uh, you know watching somebody play what happens if you put in some moving shots or you do some beautiful shots of the hall that you're in maybe or even the city that you're in so basically it was kind of this eventual progression between concert footage to produced material and so that's how my youtube channel got started and that's why it's been so much fun excellent okay i gotta go through these questions faster they're coming in like Fresh off the press, okay, from Kaya Phillips. Hello, Kaya, welcome to the stream. What do you do for intonation work? And, okay, that's a separate question, so I'm going to do these separately. Well, intonation is the big bad elephant in the room, isn't it? Something that, to be honest, doesn't come very naturally for me. But once again, I've had some amazing help from, of course, technology and just understanding how intonation works much better so to give you a little sense of my warm-up routine I take these bad boys these are airpods and I will place one airpod in my ear opposite to my cello so I look like a badass and I will put on a drone tone from this wonderful app called Tunable, not sponsored. And I like to start off with a D major scale. So I'm listening to a D uh, sawtooth wave at 441 and... 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, just having that reference of what is really truly perfect intonation in my ear somehow kind of gets it ingrained in my brain and helps a lot. I would also recommend, highly recommend, the um, Cello Mind book published by Hans Jensen. That kind of changed my life. And since, believe it or not, I didn't really investigate in this book until after I started my job here in the Seattle Symphony. And it's totally changed the way I think about intonation and um, everything. Just equal temperament, just temperament, Pythagorean, uh, all these fancy things that I had vague ideas about, but now I m much more fully understand and has helped me especially in... Uh <laughs> stuck in a little tangent there okay so uh get the cello my book and practice with a drone tone in your ear highly recommend two basic things for intonation uh and uh well there's a lot more but we can come back to it the next question is from jihoon kim i hope i'm saying that correctly how do you develop confidence when auditioning for orchestras youth orchestra oh i like how you uh, made sure to say youth orchestra well i think actually auditioning for orchestras and youth orchestras, there's a lot to be uh, learned from both, uh, both auditions. First of all, I've been thinking about this a lot, but is a concept called peak performance. My goal as a performer is to make the difference between my best time and my worst time as small as possible. I'm gonna say that one more time. I want the difference between my best time and my worst time when I perform to be as small as possible. So therefore, basically it's a concept of consistency and basically consistency. And I find that confidence is, confidence on cello is highly related with your ability to trust the way you play, if that makes any sense. Trusting the way you play. Well, how do you develop trust in the way you play? First of all, I think you have to have a deep understanding of the way you play. And so for me, one very important step whenever I prepare is to record myself, okay? Because sometimes when you're, when you're playing, your ear and your brain are working so hard to execute things and also be free that you don't always have the most analytical, um, neutral mind for analyzing yourself. So I highly recommend recording yourself and listening back. Some of my best improvement happens there because you know you assume things that you're doing, but you're actually not. And then right away, if you're picky enough on yourself, you will change that. So um, step one in, in really preparing for any audition is recording yourself to develop the confidence. That's what I was about to say. Yes, that was the roundabout way I was about to say that. Um, another way to build confidence is to play for others. So I would recommend performing and doing your audition for others. Doesn't even have to be a musician. Just getting that feeling of playing through the entire list uh, for others is such an important thing. And um, that can kind of help too. Um, and then the third thing, of course, is to not get discouraged. You know, this is much easier said than done. But um, this kind of goes back to trusting your way that you play and feeling, feeling happy about it. I think you want to try to prepare at such a level where you're feeling pretty okay. You know, it's impossible to feel 100% great about things but if you feel like you know mm, you know I worked really hard and I feel like I've done everything I can I think that's a great feeling to have when going into an audition so I hope those three tips help Jihoon okay
Next question. Wow. From Kaya Phillips again. Hello. I saw you in Gautier's Plus de Excellence. What are some of the things you learned from him that helped your playing? How was the experience? Well, Gautier is a wonderful mentor and friend. And boy, that was a, an amazing experience for me because it was kind of my first, um, first experience going to Europe and really learning about about the style of music making and it's very much uh, very very different in in a way there's so much um, greater attention focused on um, kind of tone and there's I think what I love is about Gautier is even though he's very strict with what he wants he still lets the imagination uh, kind of come through in the end because he realizes that's the end goal whenever you're playing but of course you need some strong foundational skills in order to reach that feeling and for sure one of them was sound you know oh, when we think of Gautier Capuzano a lot of the times we think about what an immense sound he has and I really learned to use the gravity of my arm much better I think you know uh, for many years, I achieved sound by pressing, you know, noob, noob cellist right here. Well, there's a much better way to draw the sound. <laughs> Capuzon is you really understand his right arm. It's amazing the kind of sound he gets, not by pressing, but by really finding the perfect combination between um, ba uh, sounding point, uh, the drawing of the bow, and bow speed. And if you listen to that long enough, you really have a feel for that, you know. <laughs> slowness to the bow yet there's an immense power so I think really focusing on sound was one of the hugely important things that I learned from the from Gautier's class and also my colleagues in the class were so inspirational and they came from such unique and different backgrounds that I think my musical world was expanded just by listening to other young musicians like myself from all around the world uh, and the way they express and the way they play. So I would uh, encourage you to keep exploring and listening to lots of other people uh, and to work on sound. Okay, question from Annelise de Jesus. I hope I said that correctly. What are some good exercises for vibrato that you would recommend? And how would you recommend this? Okay, oh, lots of questions coming in. Excellent. Um, vibrato exercises. Okay, well, this is another wonderful topic in which I struggled a lot, and I have some great tips for you in vibrato. First of all, you want to have an immense sense of control over what the left hand is doing. Vibrato is not an on off switch. And to showcase this, I'm going to put on a metronome at 60 beats per minute. And my vibrato exercise is I like to, uh, well, it's easier if I just demonstrate. Here we go.
Okay, I hope that kind of made sense. So basically, I kind of see a, um, a vibrato as a, a um, kind of like a sine wave, and I see an upper, a, an upper limit and a lower limit. And my second tip for you that I learned this from a wonderful friend of mine named Simone Porter, who taught me some tricks about vibrato, is that you never go above the pitch when you vibrate. You only hit the pitch and you go down. So if my bow represents the perfect pitch for a note, what I used to think is that the vibrato goes like this in terms of pitch. Incorrect. You're supposed to just go like this and the upper limit should go and hit the perfect note. Or else you'll always sound sharp. Uh, that's kind of worked for me. I hope that works for you. Oh, and then I would do it on each each finger. Etc. And then I would also practice vibrato between shifts. see I need to do some more work on my vibrato um, and another great way to find out the perfect resonance of a vibrato was this is a technique taught to me by my teacher Richard Aaron is to ghost a note and find the inner vibration and then match it let me explain too often we grab our string too much and when we vibrate we are suppressing the natural vibrations of the string <laughs> If we let go of the string until it makes a fuzzy sound like this, you can feel under your finger pad a kind of vibrating sensation of the string that it naturally wants to vibrate in. Now match your vibrato speed to the feeling that you're feeling underneath your finger pad. found a great vibrato speed and width that brings out the resonance that the string naturally wants to create. Kind of interesting. Okay, great. Those are three wonderful ways to work on vibrato. Okay, question from Masi Linba. Hello, Masi. How would you recommend to start learning a new challenging piece like Symphonia Concertante? Well, this is a wonderful question. And I'd like to expand the question to how do you learn a piece in general? Well, for me, one of the grave mistakes I made growing up in college and, and previous into the strategy in which I learned a new piece is I would learn a piece by playing it. <laughs> answer is you must separate your practicing mind with your performance mind at first at first you need to approach a piece from its basic foundations and for me it's approaching it from my from the weakest ex aspects and that's number one organizing my left hand uh, in a way where I can approach the piece uh, very methodically and efficiently. This includes figuring out fingerings, what string I want to play certain sections on, and I usually do this very slowly. So I do not play things in rhythm. And I also don't like to play things too loudly when I'm first starting because, I, like I said, I'm focusing on the left hand because that's my weaker that's kind of the weaker part of my preparation. So many moves in the beginning of 
a piece. So I'm thinking about, okay, well, I need to move from this hand position to this hand position. So I might isolate that and I'll practice that. <laughs> And then I also might practice that with the drone, uh, with a, whoops. Etc. Etc. So I'm really breaking things down into very, very small components. And the way I like to think of it is like I'm a monk. I'm going into a cave and I'm working on the piece before I play it for anybody. And I want to make sure that I've really gotten a good understanding for it before I uh, approach it or perform it. Hmm. Anyways, I hope that was a good answer. I'm not sure. Okay. Question from Manolo Martinez. Hello, Manolo. Hi, what's the best advice you've gotten as a musician? And from who? Thanks. Wonderful question. And believe it or not, the best piece of advice I've ever gotten from a musician was from the great soul singer, Roberta Flack. Roberta Flack is a wonderful um, artist who, uh, among other things, is known for her song, Killing Me Softly. And this was my first foray into pop and I actually worked with her for a little bit when I was younger. Worked with her and, you know, coming from a classical background, a lot of the times we get, at least as a young kid, I was stuck in the, this mindset where what I see is what I get. Hmm. What I see is what I get, especially in terms of what's on the paper and things. But Roberta Flack told me that in order for one to make really special music. You need to dig deep into your soul and have the courage to express what you're feeling inside to the outside world. Only then can there be amazing music. What does, so she said that and I, I kind of was wondering, well, 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 what does that mean? It means even if there's a little glimmer of a feeling that you have, it is your role as the artist to expen exponentially magnify that feeling so that it flows out through the instrument and into the form of sound. It's that amplification process that I didn't really understand for a long time. But I think that's such a, an amazing life lesson as well not only in music is when you have an inkling of something it's your job to really make it a reality in a clear and not exaggerated but a clear and communicative way so uh i hope that makes sense uh it's uh, it's hard to explain it's a very meta thing but um it really changed my life and so i hope that helps Oh, our YouTube live audience. Back to the YouTubes. I wish I could see the numbers of people watching. I am in a Zoom call. Okay. Could you please outline your process of preparation for orchestral auditions? Well, we spoke a little bit about this, but it has to do with feeling confident in the way you play. If you feel don't feel confident in the way you play going into an audition, uh, it's going to be tricky because your mind can play a lot of uh, games with you on an audition day. Uh, one step I didn't uh, give before, besides recording yourself playing for others, and uh, what was the last tip I gave? Uh, well, well. Anyways, uh, the the great tip I can give you uh, before on an audition day is you should eat a banana. You should eat a banana. A banana ha is full of potassium. And those little butterfly feelings you get in your stomach that can really affect the way you perform and give you the, the shakes or the, the little the freak outs, 
they seem to calm down. Eat a banana. Also, make sure you've gone to the bathroom really good and well. I'm not going to go into detail on what that means, but make sure you go to the bathroom before you perform. Because you might feel some things, and it's good to know that they aren't real. Anywho, okay. Ah, South Parker Woods, my dear friend. He recently did a cello chat, and I apologize for getting to your question so late. I need to move faster. Hi, Nathan. With all that you have learned playing in the Seattle Symphony, which is what is one or two bits of advice for those now entering the professional orchestra world or are on the audition circuit? Wow, that's a big question. I've learned so much being uh, playing in the Seattle Symphony, and perhaps there's so many, you know, obvious things: the orchestral repertoire, the 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 playing with others, the the wonderfully satisfying feeling one gets when one plays without ego in in support of a greater good for sound and everything like that. But um, I think one of the great things that I've learned is that's kind of not obvious is it's very important to be um, quite comfortable at learning lots and lots of pieces very quickly. Maybe that's not the correct, right word I want to use. Very efficiently, I would say. You need to learn a lot of music when you're uh, in an orchestra because there's new programs every week. And um, for me, uh, one of the important things is listening to recordings. I mean, this sounds so obvious, but listening to recordings when you're not familiar with the piece gives you a great idea for how things are. And, uh, hmm, you know, yeah, an what I also love about an orchestra is it gives you um, an amazing group of people who all believe in the same thing and are all kind of rooting together for one, one unique and similar goal. And there's a lot to be said about that feeling and uh, the camaraderie and the teamwork. And I think it's taught me a lot in terms of how to operate within that context and it's something that I try not to take for granted every day, but I'm still learning. And uh, yes, the great uh, duo, David Finkel and Wu Han, uh, once told me, it's easy to be nice, but it's hard to be nice all the time. Hmm, it's easy to be nice, but it's hard to be nice all the time. I think so much of being a musician is being a great human being towards others and really understanding and respecting others, supporting others, you know, throwing your hat in the ring every so often, but really realizing that we're all on the same team in the end. And we all love this for a reason that kind of connects us all. And so once you step back from the, the nitty gritty and sometimes the craziness that can come from our industry and from classical music, it gives you a lot of hope. And it reminds you why we do what we do. You know, we all have, we've all approached this beautiful art form in our own unique way. But now that we're in it, we're here to enjoy bring it to others, and to really use this as a way to change the world for good. So, whoo, okay, wow. I don't even remember the question. Okay, Manolo Martinez, hello again. How much time do you regularly get prior to a performance? Wait, how much time do you regularly get prior to a performance? Hmm, that question confuses me. But maybe it's how much time do I prepare before a performance? And lately, that number has been changing a lot. And what I think is more important is not how much time you get regularly before a performance, but how efficiently, how efficiently do you use the time that you're given? 
So my practice strategy changes immensely based on how much time I have to work. If I have something way off in the distance that um, is a big, big ordeal, I find it very important to start early and to really feel comfortable letting a piece of music seep into my skin. Well, and then alternatively, maybe I need to learn something in a day for the next thing. I will listen to it a lot because listening to it kind of seeps into my skin qu more quickly than practicing it a lot. Of course, I'll practice it and I'll really get down the fundamentals. But then eventually I'll try and connect um, what I've listened to and how I've prepared it to some sort of unique and cohesive vision. So the... The answer to your question is practice the best you can with the time you have. Okay, any advice from Mark Hugh? Any advice to improve legato connectivity of bowing? I can't seem to get notes to sound connected between up bow and down bow. Well, do I have the solution for you? I'd like you to imagine a string as a pipe or like a tube. And my fist and arm represent the tube, okay? One great way to improve your connectivity from down bow to up bow, I believe, is what you said. Or between up bow and down bow. Well, I'll just give you both ways. You can come from above a string or below a string. Let me say that one more time. When you're changing a string and you want it to be connected, you can come from above the string or below the string. So too often we think too two-dimensionally in the string, you know, like this. And I'm sure you've all seen the slow motion video of a string. When you pull it this way, it's going like this in slow motion. And when you kind of do an up bow, it's going this motion. So the real question is, how do you, how do you get something to turn from this way to this way? Well, it's kind of, the bow does a lot of the work for us by going left and right. But what happens if we were to assist it in a three dimensional manner? So on a down bow to up bow, I encourage you, Mark, to think about the transition like coming from above. So once again, I'm going down bow, I'm trying to go up bow. I will actually change my angle of attack and coax the string out. So I'm gonna try and demonstrate. It's easiest to demonstrate this on the A string. Oh, that was a terrible demonstration. I gotta do this sitting, this is impossible. So that's what it looks like to come from above. I use my entire body almost now that I'm noticing it since I get to stare at myself here on the Zoom call. Oh, that was a good one. Did you hear that one? Oh, that was a pretty good one. So on a down bow, you want to maximize the fact that you have this huge angle of attack that you have that you don't necessarily have on the D string and G string. Two. Ah, that was a good one. To come from the top. Likewise, when you're going from the C string, you can come from the bottom. So that means instead of, so I'm going to the C string, I come from the bottom of the string. Like this. So like this. If you really imagine it from that spinning string perspective, I think it makes a lot of sense. Focusing the string to turn a different direction. Give that a try, Mark. I hope that works. Uh, so you come from above or come from below. And then once you mac figure that out on the outer string, see if you can do it with the limited space you have on the D and G string. It's a much more subtle move. So I'm not thinking that gets that roughness. Ah, look at that. Much more smooth. Hey, Mike Blocks in the chat. Hey, Mike, I have my block strap here somewhere, but ah, uh, this is uh, to Mike. This is the the neck strap. Mike Block has the block strap. I have the neck strap. <laughs>
question from Christian Guadic. Hello, Christian. I've been studying music that is relatively unknown, and I had to take the musical text as a starting point to learn them. Later, I realized that generally, by tradition, a lot of standard repertoire is played in a way a little removed from what the text says. Only by tradition. What do you think about this? Should the interpreter use more uh, the, use more the musical text than what by tradition is done with music by Tchaikovsky? Bar okay, this is a wonderful question. Um, well, I just finished reading Eric Silber's book about the Bach cello suites. I know, I should have read it a long time ago. But apparently, the version of the Bach suites so somebody correct me in the chat if I'm wrong. I'm I'm a, I'm a young guy. I don't really know. I'm not an expert on Bach. But apparently, the version of Bach that Pablo Casals found in a music shop way long ago was an edited version by Grutzmacher. Can somebody confirm or deny this? And basically, I think this is kind of what you're saying is, um, what is authentic and what isn't. I think is kind of what Christian Guandique is saying. And this is a very good question. I think, well, depends if you're a purist or not. And even then, what, is, what, do, what do purists know exactly? They, they have their historical texts as much as they can. And the, but, you know, the box suites were probably not made for the cello. They were probably made for um, a violoncello a piccolo or a viola da gamba, something like that. So there's always all these questions about what is authentic and what is not. For me, hmm, it's so important to stay true to the music, but at the same time, find a balance between what the composer is trying to achieve and how to bring that desire into our modern day society. Let me say that one more time. It's important to try and understand what a composer is trying to achieve and make it work for the situation that you have. I think is kind of the answer that I, I personally believe in. It's constantly changing. Of course, you don't want to do anything crazy out of this world, but I think, especially nowadays, music can, <sighs> music should be a form of an expression of yourself. And if you don't feel that a composer's original text Oh boy, I feel very scared saying this on Cello Bello. But I think there is a balance. You can do what the composer wants. And especially if it's a modern piece, as you're saying. Oh wait, you're studying music that is relatively unknown. Oh, okay. Well, in some way, if I were to play a piece of music that was relatively unknown, that would give me an immense sense of freedom because there's no preconceived notion about it, about the particular piece. And I think basically that's the responsibility you bear bringing an unknown piece to the world is you have the power to influence one's immediate interpretation, not just of you as a player, but of the composer. So I think you should really internalize that responsibility and come up with a solution that you feel comfortable with expressing to the world. Hmm. I hope that's a good enough answer. Okay. Igor Sarmintos. Hello, Igor. Just curious. I don't know if this question was asked before, but which cello do you have in your hands now? Ah, thank you for asking. This is a wonderful modern instrument by Joseph Grubau and Sigrun Seifert from Petaluma, California, made in 2008. Believe it or not, this is my first ever full-size cello. It's my baby. I've known it for a long time and I've gotten to understand the way it operates and plays. And it's a wonderful 
expressive and um, it feels like the cello has adopted a little bit of my personality but of course that's an incredibly biased statement but I always love the excitement it brings when I play in a hall or stage <laughs> quite special it's made by a maker named joseph henri it's made in 1850 and it actually belonged to the great cellist janos starker so this is a wonderful privilege for me to play on this bow it's a perfect 80 grams and it i feel like i have the thor's hammer or the shield from the avengers movie when i play on this bow Wonderful spiccato. It, it's a wonderful bow, and I am, I'm so grateful to play on it, and it's such a joy. Um, Trisha Kumar. Hello, Trisha from Mexico City. Fantastic talk. Thank you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm having fun. I hope you all, all are too. Any tips on thumb position? Ah, thumb position is interesting. Um, you know, uh, left hand, my left hand thinking is everything is in a certain hand position. And so, uh, the thumb is kind of an extension of that thinking where I anchor myself wherever my thumb is I try and make sure my other fingers are located in in a scale or per pattern no matter what and one of the great exercises that my teacher Richard Aaron uh, um, is a big proponent of that really increased my security in the left hand is thirds and sixths with the left hand. But as you can see, I've been taking a little bit of, I've been missing my days a little bit on that, that little exercise, but thirds and minor, major and minor thirds. <laughs> my my thumb confidence and uh, yes there are a lot of wonderful exercise books that I think uh, would be very good to uh, think about uh, in terms of thumb position well thumb position is very hard but uh, I have a nice big callus so it's a little bit easier now hello YouTube live what is the role of contemporary music in developing one's career in music also, when you start working on a new obscure piece, where do you start? How do you approach it? Especially if you can't find any background information or recordings. Wonderful question. Um, well, first of all, contemporary music. One thing I would like to strive 
Um, now speaking to what I am guessing is a classically music, classically musically driven audience, is why do we compartmentalize so much in terms of genres of music? To me, great music is great music. And yes, we have such familiari familiarity in this world that we live in, but don't close oneself off to other forms of music and other genres. There's so much beauty and culture in all forms of music and all genres that it's so important to respect, educate, and investigate other kinds of music because not we're not just classical musicians we're we're artists and we're human beings and music while it can seem like a small community in the classical music community it's really part of this greater whole and so i would love us if we could encourage each other to be more open to all types of genres of music as a as forms of expression and forms of happiness. Okay, back to the question. What's the role of contemporary music in developing in developing one's career in music? Well, I will give a disclaimer. I would hardly consider myself um, super, super knowledgeable in contemporary music, but I will speak about the kinds of things I learn every time I perform a contemporary piece of music. For one, it really forces me to, to drop away my preconceived notions about a piece, about music in general, and to approach it with a sincerity and originality that can be quite freeing. I, we spoke a little bit about this earlier. Um, in a way, no one's ever heard this piece before, and so it's a great privilege for one to explore a different type of communication to an audience member who may have not uh, heard a piece before. And what I mean by that is I feel like contemporary music teaches me to be a more free communicator. It teaches me really the essence of, of music is not in the syntax or the, the, the language, but the emotion and the intention behind music. That's what always surprises me after a wonderfully powerful contemporary music, I'm, I'm guessing classical contemporary music performance. And it makes me realize I have much less things to fear in this world uh, in terms of learning and performing. Um, uh, bah, 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 bah. When I'm working on a new obscure piece, where do I start? Uh, what we talked about, Alyssa. I start from my foundational uh, weaknesses, which is the left hand. Of course, you want to be very strong in rhythm in contemporary music. I hope I'm not stereotyping. Very important to have that core. Um, metronome work, very important. Maybe understanding the structure. Are there any patterns? Very important to work off a score when you're dealing with a new piece of music so you really understand the lay of the land um and good luck renzo gordillo hi do you have the krentz wolf eliminator why yes i do and it can be yours for the low low price of just kidding any advice to select an eliminator device greetings from peru oh peru hello um, and, uh, it's a wonderful device that I actually started putting on since I was in college. And believe it or not, it's made by a wonderful man, uh, in the Seattle area named Kevin Krentz. We are good friends. 
I, I hope I, I'll send this video to him. And I think it's the most effective wolf eliminator I've ever used. And it's customizable in terms of its placement. Why don't I show it to you on this subject? I'm going to take off, take out the wolf eliminator now. But in the meantime, how's everybody doing? Write in the chat how you're doing. There's so many questions. I just wish I could see what you guys are chatting in the chat. You know, like the chill chat. It's a cello chat, not a interrogation. Okay, here is the Krentz modulator. Very unique. Whenever you see it on the cello, whoops. Whenever you see it on the cello, you're only seeing this part. But it's like an iceberg. It has a huge thing in the in the bottom with a sealed sort of weight in the in this little tube and it kind of suppresses any unwanted vibrations it's super fun to use i always whenever little kids ask me about it i always tell them it's a volume knob so let me put it back in and i'll demonstrate let me make sure i'm putting it in correctly that would be a disaster if i put it in incorrectly and I am putting it in in three, two, one. Nice. So whenever little kids ask me about the, the Krentz modulator, I say, oh, it's a volume knob. So I go. Uh, let me just turn the volume up a little bit. thing I like to do. I love playing with kids. I mean playing for kids. You know what I mean. <laughs> Anyways, question from Daniel Lim. When is the Nathan Chan podcast coming out? Soon, I hope. Once I get a nice mic and I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I, that would be fun. That's a great idea. Hello, Daniel. Ah, Francesca McNeely, my dear friend Franny. Hi, Nathan. Have you experimented with different end pins? Any recommendations or endorsements? Um, good question. I'm not too picky about my end pin, but I do think carbon fiber is the way to go. Uh, just in terms of convenience and lightness, um, I like a super, super sharp end pin. Um, I'm not the perfect person to ask about end pins, but I, I like this one. I don't know what it's called, but it's light and it works. And... Yeah, I would just say if you have a metal end pin, consider carbon fiber. I think that'll help you a lot. But the 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 really fancy ones that I've been seeing out there, I don't know too 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 much about. But highly recommend carbon fiber or this composite material or something lighter basically. Cuz you're back. You, we need to last a long time in this career and you don't want to break your back carrying your cello. Okay. Uh, question from Glay Marquez de uh, oi. Oh. Hello, Glay. Nathan, what is the piece that you like the most and why? Well, I don't have a piece that I like the most, but I have pieces that I sincerely like. And maybe on that note, it's time for a musical break. Because I'm tired of talking and I'm so glad I have this wonderful, fresh glass of water. I'll play you a piece that's been very influential for me in terms of how I um, enjoy music. And it's a piece called Julio by Mark Summer. It combines a multitude of genres and it really taught me that, like I said, great music is great music. And so I'd like for you all to enjoy this piece with me uh, right now.
I just wanted to give my oh, my mouth a rest for a little bit. That Oh, that was an answer to a question. I forgot. So that's one of the pieces that I like the most. And because I think it puts a smile on my face every time. So much fun. And I just, makes it makes me feel free. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. From Christian Guandique again, I want to ask you, do you think that doing score to tour damages the string in any way? For example, as in fifth sweep by Bach? Or the Sonata by Kodaya? Okay, um, I don't think so. Nope, easy answer. Uh, because in most of those cases, you are loosening the string from what it is normally done. So from a physics standpoint, I could potentially see maybe uh, a squarter tour that tightens the string to be potentially more damaging. But loosening the string, mm, I think it's fine. Ah, Inigo Garcia Esquivel. Hello, Inigo. Hi, Nathan. Thank you for the video. Hope you're doing well. Thoughts about carbon fiber cellos and bows? Well, I think they're wonderful. And I think they're a lot of fun. I actually really would like to get one. Um, I would like to investigate a little bit more of how they sound under the ear, but from my experience, listening to them from an audience perspective, I think it's it's amazing. Uh, I think they're going to keep getting even better with 3D printing and stuff, and I'm super excited for those kinds of innovations in uh, the making of cellos and bows. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of carbon fiber, and I would like to eventually get one uh, as a spare cello. Okay, well, I'm getting a little message over here that says, this marks the end of the questions. If you can get, oh, I shouldn't read what I'm supposed to be doing, but thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Cello Chat hosted by Cello Bello. My name is Nathan Chan, and today we had a really fun discussion about technique, the journey of uh, arts and technology merging into one, and we played some fun pieces along the way, including the third Bach cello suite and Julio by Mark Summer. I'm so glad that you all tuned in this wonderful evening. I hope you're staying safe and healthy, and let the music live on. Thank you.